Welcome to our World of Fiery videos, covering topics of everyday importance to print providers. Today we will cover basics of color management. The first thing I want to talk about is the color space we're probably all most familiar with, which is RGB color. RGB color, by definition, is what we call device dependent. We'll talk more about that in a moment. The nature of the RGB color model is that the colors red and green and blue add up together to form white. So sometimes this is called the additive color model. This goes back to the experiment you might remember from grammar school where they, you went in a dark room and you had three flashlights, red and a green and a blue filtered flashlight on a, on a wall. And you learned that you could combine those colors to make different colors as we see on this slide. But again, the most important thing is that where all those colors combined at the center, we form white. As soon as we talk about RGB color and remind you that all of your capture devices, such as cameras and scanners, if you still have any scanners around, and all your monitors work in RGB, the first question that comes back about printing color is, why can't I just print with the RGB colors? And the answer is, RGB colors are by their definition opaque. So if you think about a red fire truck, the fire truck is red because it absorbs some of the light and reflects some other of the light. If we simplify for a moment or for a few moments here our understanding of white light, the light that's all around us, you look at this slide, you can see that white light is the combination of red and green and blue light, essentially, in equal combinations. So this is a simpler way for us to think about this while we understand this. So if we talk about the red fire truck, the red fire truck absorbs the green wavelengths, absorbs the blue wavelengths, and reflects the red wavelengths. By its very nature of reflecting red, we know that it's opaque, which is to say we can't see through the fire truck. So if I try to print a color, let's try to print a purple color. So I put some RGB inks into my press, and I put down the order so that I print the red down first and the blue second, and I print a combination of red and blue that on my monitor looked like it made a terrific purple. If we look at this sample here, you can see the substrate on the bottom and the inks piled up that I've printed on my press. Let's go back to our simple model of understanding white light, which is to say that white light is equal combination of red and green and blue light. Just like the fire truck, what's going to happen to the red light? The red light's going to be absorbed by the blue. The green light is also going to be absorbed by the blue. Blue light is going to reflect off the blue and back to the observer's eye. The only problem is your customer will say, where's my purple? Well, you could get out there on the press and start scraping blue ink off the sheet to show them there's red behind it, but there's no way you're going to get those RGB colors to combine to give the illusion of the purple color that you saw on the screen without using a purple ink. Let's talk about another device-dependent color model. And again, I'll come back to this device dependency in just a minute. CMYK is the color model with, with which we print. Cyan, magenta, and yellow are sometimes called the subtractive color space because as we add these together, we go away from white, and when we combine all three of them, we get black, or approximately black. So. The way I'm going to use CMYK color is I'm going to use these as transparent filters. So these inks are not opaque, but rather transparent. And if I want to print a particular color, like blue in this case, I'm going to put down two of my inks to absorb essentially two-thirds of the visible wavelengths, and none, or very little, of the third color, what we sometimes call the unwanted component, because I want your eye to see that. So what happens here with my simple model of white light with RGB coming out of it? Cyan ink, by definition, transmits green and blue, but absorbs or blocks red. And you see the red portion of the, way of the spectrum getting absorbed by the cyan here. I told you also that cyan transmits green, so we see the green light going through this transparent ink, but magenta is the ink that blocks green. Magenta transmits red and transmits blue. So now what we have left is the blue transmitted by the magenta reflected back to the observer's eye and at this point 
I've given the observer the illusion of a blue color without using a blue ink. So that's the basics of how color works and why we print with CMYK. The next topic is the idea of device dependency, which I told you both RGB and CMYK color models are device dependent. This simply means that the appearance of these colors is dependent on the device with which we capture or display them. So there's an example here with a couple computer screens. You can see that they look visibly different. You can get a great example of this if you go into an electronics store, look at the big row of 25 TVs on the top shelf, all broadcasting the exact same channel, but the colors look different from one screen to the other. You're experiencing the nature of device dependency. When we come to CMYK, this is where this really becomes a business problem for us in the printing industry because the CMYK values that look correct on my digital print engine or my conventional printing press or whatever my final production process is are not going to look the same on any of the other printers in my shop if I just send those same CMYK values. The way we solve the problem of device dependency is we introduce the idea of a device independent color space. LAB is the most popular, if you will, it's the best known and most frequently talked about device independent color space. So LAB is unique in that it is not related to any device and there are really no input or output devices in our workflows that technically use lab. What the lab color space represents is the way a color appears to the standard human observer. This goes back to a series of experiments that started in 1931 in France. This group, the CIE, or the Commission Internationale L'Eclairage, basically did an experiment on a lot of people to see how our eyes work, and they developed this metric, or this color system, and you're actually seeing a plot on the right there of the original XYZ color space from 1931, and they said, we can quantify what a color looks like, okay, with numbers, which is very, very important. So how do we bring device-independent color into our workflow? The answer is, this is why we need a spectrophotometer. Spectrophotometer, unlike your densitometer in your press room that simply reports density, the spectrophotometer basically reports an invariant description of the color, which I can convert mathematically into LAB or some other device-independent color space. So before we go on and talk about color management, let's just have a basic definition first about color gamut. And if I had a way to ask all of you on the session what you think the device gamut is, I suspect that almost everyone would be able to at least say the device gamut is the total range of colors on my device. So it's the total range of colors that maybe my camera can see, but more importantly from where we produce this, it's the total range of colors that my output device can produce. And you're almost right. The problem with your definition is you have not talked about device dependent or independent space. So the proper definition of gamut is the total reproducible colors expressed in device independent color space. By which I mean, if I look at my computer screen in front of me, and I put the brightest red on there possible, it's 255, right? And now I have you do the same thing on your computer screen. You put 255 on your screen. Do they look the same? Absolutely not. It's a device-dependent color space. But if I take a spectrophotometer and measure the red on my screen and tell you that it's 123 in LAB space and the numbers aren't important here, we measure your screen and see that it's some other combination like 456 LAB, now we have begun to define our problem, which is that the colors are dependent on these devices and don't have the same appearance from one device to another. Now we're ready to understand color management. Color management is the idea of mapping the colors from one device-dependent space to another device-dependent space through device-independent space where we know what the colors look like. Or we can technically say that it's gamut mapping with the object of with the intent of preserving the appearance of objects or colors. We do all this with an ICC profile. An ICC profile is simply an index or what we sometimes call a lookup table or a LUT that defines the mapping 
of one device dependent space to device independent space. So if we made a profile for your monitor from that measurement of that brightest red, that 255 on your monitor that I said measured 456 in LAB, that would be one entry in this index, in this lookup table. Let's look at how we use these profiles in a, in a workflow. Well, I have one more color gamut slide to, to talk to you about here for a minute. Just to give you an understanding of the challenge that we're dealing with with color management and printing in general, we can see in the projection of the XYZ color space, this is all the colors that are defined in this numerical model, generally your RGB that you see on your monitor or capture with your camera has approximately this shape or this gamut in device independent space. Your offset press has a much, much smaller gamut, okay? This is just the nature of CMY versus RGB. And so what you're going to see is that we have a problem or we're going to have to achieve in the course of our color management what we call gamut compression. We have an RGB source file, which is a great way to work because you get the most out of all your output devices. But we're going to have to compress that RGB down to the gamut of our conventional presses we show here or maybe down to the gamut of some digital device, which as we see here can sometimes give us a little bit more gamut than conventional print. we look at spot colors, you can also see that spot colors are going to have the same problem. And we'll talk more about spot colors in a few minutes, but you can see that they're well out of gamut of the conventional or even the digital press, and so we're also going to experience gamut compression of the spot colors, which is simply to say your customer is going to be disappointed if they use a very bright Pantone color that looked great on their screen and you convert it to CMYK when you print it on your digital or conventional press. Now we'll talk about this workflow. So the way I use ICC profiles is I use ICC profiles to convert from one color space into or out of device independent color space. Start with a simple example. I have an RGB image on the page. Maybe it's Adobe RGB or sRGB or one of these standard color spaces in Photoshop. The ICC profile that I'm going to use here is used to convert the device dependent RGB values into LAB or into this device dependent space where basically I say that's what the color looks like. Now I want to take that appearance and render it on my output device. I'm going to always need a second output, pro a second ICC profile. This profile we use in reverse. Rather than converting from device to device independent, we use it to convert from device independent space, the LAB values that tell me what the colors look like, to device dependent CMYK on our output device, which is our digital presses we're showing here. If I have CMYK inputs, which we know we all do, I'm also going to need to define a source profile or an input profile that tells me for every combination of cyan plus magenta plus yellow plus black in that source file, what's it supposed to look like? What should the LAB values be to tell me how that appears? And again, I can map through LAB space and through my output profile to look up a different CMYK recipe to give me the same appearance as the way the CMYK appeared in the source file. I told you we'd come to spot colors, so let's talk just for a minute about spot colors. Spot colors are, by definition, colors that on a conventional press we print with separate inks if we really want to match them. On the digital front end and all your digital devices, if you have color management in place, you have a distinct advantage because you can actually convert your spot colors directly to the output color space. And again, as we showed on that earlier slide, if you have a little bit more gamut than the conventional press, you're going to get a better match to the spot color than if you just looked up the CMYK equivalents in Photoshop or in your Pantone fan book. So I'll show you one more slide about how this works. But just to talk a little bit about spot colors, so I have some colors like a Pantone color or it might be a custom color named for the customer's brand or whatever it is. I look it up on my digital front end on my RIP in a library that tells me for that spot color, what are the LAB values? So basically I've gotten out of the need for an input profile because the spot color library tells me exactly what the device independent values, the LABs are. 
And I can take those LABs just like I did for all my other color management, convert them through the output profile for my device, and find the best CMYK combination, what I sometimes call the recipe, to simulate that spot color on my output device. Thank you for watching. For additional resources and e-learning classes on this topic, visit our website. To see all recorded sessions and register for upcoming World of Fiery webinars, please visit efi.com forward slash WOF webinars.